The holidays are almost here, and we are offering all Shifting Perceptions listeners an exclusive 15% off all posters and prints on jalders.com. Just use code SHIFT2018 at checkout. Hey, this is Jay. And this is Chelsea. Welcome to the Shifting Perceptions podcast. We are bringing you inspiration to live a more creative lifestyle. Because our favorite people are the ones that choose the path less traveled. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode nine. This is Chelsea Alders. Jay and I got to chat with the one and only Garrett Dutton, otherwise known as G Love this week. Our journey as fans of G Love's and friends of Garrett's has been one of the pillars in our own story of success. Some of Jay's earliest experiences being on stage in front of thousands were due to G Love and being able to share his story from his early days learning acoustic guitar in Philly to becoming the world famous rock star he is now is beyond inspiring. We got the opportunity to cover just about everything from street art and Picasso to Jack Johnson and Nas. If you don't know G yet, this interview will have you hooked. His music is diverse, his personality humble, hilarious, and kind, and his stories of trying new things, pivoting through the music industry, and finding comfort in his current style and sound We'll give you an exclusive inside look to his methods and his truly unique style. Let's jump in. Hey, G, what's up, brother, man? Yo, Jay. Yo, Chelsea. How are you guys doing? We're good. Yeah, we're doing awesome. We're really, like, stoked to talk to you, man. We're, we've been excited about this one. Oh, me too, man. I'm excited for you guys doing this podcast. This is cool. So... It's uh, pretty cool that of all the days we picked, we didn't even realize we uh, got your interview on, on voting day, which is a big one, I know, for you. Did you get out and vote already? Yeah, we did, actually. Um, we, uh, we were really on top of it this year. I'm, I'm uh, happy to say we, we actually voted early. We could go to the polling place early. Um, so we went last week in Boston and um, ran out with the baby. It was pouring rain. Oh, and... Man. uh we, 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 it was like pouring. It was like raining sideways when your umbrellas get blown away, yeah. <laughs> like like Jesus. inside out. But we got it done, man. So, it's dedication. Yeah, happy to get it done, and uh, obviously, uh, politics are on a lot of people's mind right now. I know you've been you've been like super vocal about it, which I'm I'm proud of you, and it's inspiring to see what you're doing with your platform. And I think you know doing your interview on on voting day is a great reminder that like one person can make a big difference. You know what I mean? And like I wanted to ask you, I want to start off jumping into your creative process a little bit because I'm Chelsea and I are both really fascinated by that. Um, so. With your politics being on the forefront of your mind, I wanted to know if you could talk about the power of choosing lyrics nowadays. Has it uh, transformed as you've become more vocal with your political and social views? Are you really consciously thinking about the, that uh, emphasis on what you're saying in your songs, maybe different than you were 20 years ago? How has that changed? Um, well, you know, it's funny. I don't, I don't really think it's the heart of it's changed much at all. I mean, um, you know, like I just wrote this post yesterday because one thing that I guess the question that has a lot of answers, but, um, I guess one point that I would start off with is like, um, on, on social media, you have a different way to, um, kind of use your voice than ever before. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's in, a, in both a good way and a bad way. Yeah. But, um, you know, like that being said, yeah, I have been pretty vocal about, um, the politics kind of, um, especially in the last year with Trump getting voted in office, but, um, I have used some of these platforms to kind of speak my mind on, on things going on in, in our world. Um, so it's, it's apparent that I'm doing that, but, um, I guess the, the one thing that like, um, a lot of people say that, you know, don't agree with you or maybe are trolls online or whatever, they, they, like I noticed that the thing that people like to say is like, you should stick to entertaining, stick to music, you know, don't talk about politics, you know, or something, something along those lines, which to me is like highly insulting. And I guess it goes to the broader question was just like I've always been an activist you know I, I I've always gone to like 
rallies since I was in high school. We would take take um, a school bus down to DC to you know march in the um, in the peace rallies when we were on on the verge of like reinstating the draft. Yeah, that was actually form. my next question. If like that politics had really been in your, you know, in your bones since you were really young, or if this was all more recent. Yeah, no, I've always kind of been an activist, and um, so so then you know, fast forward to now, and people say, oh, you know, you should stick to music. I liked you better when you did. Well, if, you, if that's the point, is that like you know, um, I've always kind of been an activist kid, and and I've always written songs about it. So as far as how my creative process may or may not be influenced by, you know, what's going on in politics this year. It's always been influenced by politics and the world at large. And I've always written songs about all things in my life, like from the simple and the, you know, seemingly mundane to like, you know, the, the most kind of poignant um, topics facing, you know, our society. So I've always, that's always been part of my process to include all these different aspects of my life. I just think that now with social media being so out front, well, if you want people to know how you feel about something, it's real easy to let, you know, 10 or 20 or a hundred thousand people know what you feel in the, in 10 seconds. And that's kind of where we're at now. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know. And it's true. And then that's like a little, I don't know. I feel like you almost need to just like post it and leave it. It's hard to like, engage sometimes because right. you figure with a hundred thousand people it's not all going to be welcomed on their little instagram feed when it pops up so it's not always easy i think it's like super interesting because i know a lot of your roots comes comes from like the blues and like hip-hop and like it's it seems like a lot of um your musical inspirations are really based around storytelling and it's it's strange in a way how like social media has like complemented that and almost taken over as a way to tell stories. Yeah, I mean, it, it really is. It's um, it's utterly changed the way we communicate and, and get our point across. And it's also, it, it gives you a chance to, on all sides, be a lot bolder because, you know, it's like the old saying, sticks and stones, <laughs> you know, can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. But it's kind of opposite now. It's like nowadays, you know, People are really able to, yeah, be just that, be bold and really come out with these strong views, and they don't have to do it in a way of public speaking, which I guess merely like you know. Yeah, they're not going to get stoned on the podium for saying what they say. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, tw- like within 20 years ago, if you wanted people to know you were against something, but you couldn't really do something. I guess you could do like a phone bank, but if you really wanted to. You would have to kind of show up at a, a protest or a rally or something and be a part of a certain thing that you believe in. So now mm-hmm. everybody's gotten put in. You know, it's a Chelsea's point about like engaging back. It's, it's just that sort of thing. It's like people. I actually, you know, while we're talking about it, it's funny because I just started writing a, um, a draft of something that um, that I was wanting to send to um let me see to like my fellow artists and people that that don't use their social media to engage their crowd with like things that they may believe you know because they're because it's just the opposite thing they're scared of like losing business like a lot of people just say oh i just want to keep you know my music just right down the middle not really you know saying this or that's good or you kind of an escape or such is fine but like isn't art and hasn't it always been about you know um an undercurrent of like and a it's like a social platform it always has been like i just was there's this great series called genius about picasso um it's on netflix and um, yeah we haven't watched that yet is like it like on good? our queue yeah. yeah oh yeah it's, it's amazing and like you know like he was, you know, he was fighting against Nazism and fascism and with his artwork and speaking out against like Franco and stuff before he got into power. And, you know, he was very politically active. And and that's what artists do, right? So, and, and yeah, and funny like, enough, like the ones, yeah, the ones that were like 
that we idolize, like the ones that we put up on pedestals, they're there because they did take these massive stances. The the ones that aren't sort of yeah. stepping out and being a part of it all, they're they disappear into yeah. the into the grain. So it does make a difference to take a stance for sure. I just wrote this little blurb over it. I was I get so upset, like I'm like, you know, why don't people step up? You know, because I know it is. They're they're worried about like, oh, well, I don't want to lose followers, or I don't. I don't want to say something that's going to offend somebody because then they might not buy a ticket to my gig. You know, it's like, you know, it's, it's to me, it's really like, come on, seriously, like be yourself, you know, like, as a, like, I just think a lot of people are So I go, I didn't post this yet, but to my fellow artists, we are leaders of the very spirit of the people we serve. So those who sing of everything from love and peace, of fighting for what's right, of legalizing cannabis, to partying from the profound to the inane, from the spiritual to the everyday. Consider this. Why not use platforms to affect a positive change and an energetic boost for those activists who, in the trenches, desperately need energized love and support from our big voices? Are you so concerned about your business and the amount of followers you have that you won't speak your mind on social media and let people know where you stand? Will you really, as the troll's favorite line is, quote, stay out of politics and stick to entertaining. Musicians and artists have always been the voice of the underground. Have some courage, my friends. Use your voice. We need you all. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's why I'm not. I love it. Well, I think also that actually that actually brings us to sort of your voice and a lot of what we want to talk about. Because I think... You know, we've gotten to know you in a lot of really cool ways. We've gotten to see a little bit about your creative process. We've we've sort of known you through the years in a lot of different avenues. And I think the one thing we always loved about you is how open and you're just always so ready to share this stuff with everyone and just say, even when it's your music, if it's not politically, you know, not a part of this political correctness, but just like, a, hey, does this sound good? Like, is this going to work? Or is this something that should be said or not? And it's an awesome thing. It's a really cool way in the way that you create. But I guess I know Jay has a question about this. Yeah. So I, I, here's like something that I struggle with, G, and I'd love your opinion on it. So for me, as like a visual artist, I, I have actually texted you about that because it's something that's on my mind also. But then so for me, I don't know how your process works, but like when I when my muse like speaks to me, I'm not always like. I'm usually not in control of like the visions and the inspirations that come to me. Like sometimes I'll be like in the shower or driving or sketching and, and like an idea will come to me that seems so powerful and so beautiful and so inspiring. And I feel like it needs to be brought into the world. And I'm not always the one driving that inspiration. Like if I get an idea for a painting and I paint it, but even though I have uh, like views that have nothing to do with that painting, it feels almost at times it feels almost unnatural for me to try to, get the steering wheel of that inspiration as opposed to just being like the vehicle for that idea. So like, I know for you, you have some songs, like you've said that that could come across as like more like party songs and they're like amazing lighthearted songs about love and life and sex and drugs and great stuff. And then you have songs that are a lot more politically engaging. Like, is that creative process for you different where like you just hear a a dope beat and you just want to make a song and, it, and as opposed to like crafting a thought and an idea to fit within that muse, like how does that work for you? Yeah. I mean, I guess you kind of hit on the nail on the head when, and it's like something that I think a lot of artists say reminds me of like Keith Richards book where, you know, he was something like, it was not him writing the songs. He's just kind of like this conduit. And, and as an artist, as a musician, as a writer, or anything, it's like you're you're just keeping your mind and open to kind of receive, like you said, this inspiration when it hits you. And it could be when you're in the shower, it could be when you're sleeping, it could be when you're you know, getting yelled at. <laughs> anything, right? whatever's, whatever's going on, it's good. <laughs> You're drifting off to sleep, so that's that's a lot of time when you really got to get up and make sure you yeah. write down. <laughs> um, but like, hey, you're you're just open to the possibilities of these ideas coming in your head, and then and then yeah, and then and then take that initial inspiration, and which is like the muse, or you know the the uh, result of whatever is amusing you, um, and 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 then you got it into like something that has merit that that 
with your creative skill that you honed over the years can really turn that initial inspiration into something kind of, you know, hopefully profound. And that's just a process. So I guess, I guess that's kind of where, where I'm at. Yeah. yeah. Well, and with that, like, are you always, are you finding that it's like every song is completely different? Like, is it the, you hear the harmonica in your head first? Like, do you hear the music first and then the lyrics come? Like, talk to us about how that happens for you. Well, okay. Like the most recent one that happened was it was, it was a sleep one. Which are always like the ones that you did are real sneaky because <laughs> yeah. you know when they hit you, you're you're basically you know half asleep or all the way asleep or just about to be all the way asleep, and then all of a sudden this idea pops into your head and you think, oh man, this is awesome, and you're sitting there dreaming, and you're dreaming this song, you're like, oh yeah, it's a hit, you know, oh, this is so good, I don't need to get up. It's so simple. I got it. Yeah, I'll remember it tomorrow. Wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> and then on. it's like you I feel it slipping. Up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so you're just like, um, you're just like, okay. So, yeah. so hey, the one I the one I got the other morning was like, actually, because I've been doing this chant, which is because I say with the crowd, like, give me more love, more love, more love, more love. You know, so I was like, been thinking about making this into into a song. Yeah, you know, I just had an idea for like this slide riff, which is like, you know, just like a repetitive thing. And then, I don't know. Yeah, I I just had this whole orchestration in my head. I did get up and like write it into my phone, and then kind of sang it into my phone. And then I went back to sleep. <laughs> you know I mean? But but I guess every song is unique. The, that one I kind of was hearing like this guitar like with the kind of lift and then this this chant um and then but uh, um a lot of things happen differently like sometimes uh you know sometimes i sit around and actually you know i like to write like during the day as like a job where i get a cup of coffee and my notepad and sit somewhere quiet and kind of pursue ideas that have been in my head for a while or try to come up with something on the spot or work or existing ideas. And then there's other times where, you know, I smoke a joint like at night and kind of my fingers seem to kind of explore the the fret board of the guitar in a different way than I do like during kind of working hours and oftentimes in those kind of euphoric moments, I stumble upon weird little riffs and I'll record them. If I go back to more like you know during the daytime work hours and say, Okay, well Oh well, this was cool. You know, this I just thought was cool because I was super stoned. You know, yeah, <laughs> Jay no, has a lot of those. I too. always and do that. And then I'll pursue <laughs> ideas. You know, Cause, cause some of the stuff is, is is just that. Like it was really cool for the moment. So it's not actually is really cool. Period. Yeah. Well, that was my next question. Do you have a steady? I mean, I know you're traveling all the time, so like any type of schedule is difficult. But do you have like a steady? like work hours, like you say, every day I'm going to do this, or it's just today I can fit this in, so I'm going to sit and do two hours of writing. Like, how does that schedule look I like? Mean, yeah, I mean, I always say, oh, yeah, I'm going to do all this today. <laughs> 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 but, yeah, I mean, I mean, no, I mean, I'm really bad about it, and um, and procrastination, of course, is, is another part of it, too. But, I mean, honestly, um, you know, now being like a parent and, um, you know, not even we got this place at the Cape, which is a real creative place, but it's like a property that needs some managing and we got a garden and shit and all this stuff to break up and stuff. So even now when I'm home, um, I got a lot of chores to do. So to me, the time to sit and write gets more and more valuable, um, especially during the the kind of work hours of the day, um, which sounds kind of crazy, but it is challenging to make the effort. Um, my things, you know, because I'm a touring musician, a lot of my time is spent traveling to the gigs, setting up and getting to the next gig over and over and over again. So it seems like the more success you have, the more, 
you get taken away from the original creative process, which was just hours and hours and hours and hours and hours alone in a room writing and shedding and honing the craft. And the more success you have, the more that takes you away from that just initial thing. Yeah. I was going to ask you, G, so like speaking of your craft, right? So you've done a lot of experimenting. Like I've, I think I first picked up one of your CDs. I think it was like probably 95 ish, somewhere around that. Like Uh listening to your music for that long, like you've done a lot of experimenting and like in, in that experimenting in that 25 plus career year career, you've kind of like created this amazing fan base and this like signature sound that's come from different inspirations. Like, I guess I wanted to know, like, do you ever wish or are you ever working on like this complete crazy ass departure from what you've created? Like, do you have some like country or like punk rock yeah, like album? You suddenly like... just want to be like a full on country star or something. Like, does it ever just come where you just feel like you want to break out? Like, I just want to do something different now. Like, you know, <laughs> have you ever done that? Like, or thought about that? Yeah. I mean, for sure. Like I've written like whole like albums, like, you know, imagine like kind of like, different personas because uh, yeah like i certainly like have a lot of different influences in all different types of music and there's yeah there's always been time where i'm like yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah i've come up with a lot of I, I guess um the one that got it kind of got closest to well, the one that was kind of most of a departure stylistically was probably this band that I had with Chuck Treese back in the day, a lottery, mm-hmm. which was a, just a two piece. And it was kind of, you know, it was like before the book, he's, so it wasn't like, a, it, wasn't, it was kind of not like, oh, we're going to be a two piece. Like that's yeah. kind of always in my, was always in my wheelhouse anyways. Um, but, um, yeah, I had this idea that we would, and I had like face paint thing envisioned, uh, um, and it was kind of more like I don't know, well, it wasn't like punk rock, it was more like like you know harder, okay, kind of rock. I don't know, yeah, like I, I've had a lot of ideas, about stuff like that over the years, and um, and written a bunch for like little projects like that, and then. Well, so rewinding through um, that, that actually brings me back to, yeah. um, like, well, how... Nothing ever, nothing ever breaks through. Okay. <laughs> well, let us know when you come out with your, <laughs> your like, punk Metallica rock tribute. album. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be you first in line, your hair too. out, like, be a metal band. <laughs> I like the face painting. You could do, like, that whole, like, what was the... No, I've thing? always wanted to be a, a, a lead female singer, so it's probably going to be, like, me, like, Justin... It would be Kirby very acceptable drag, nowadays. Like, like, Lou Reed... David Bowie style, you know? Yeah. Dude, no, I, I totally want to see that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually remember you like busting out some TLC when we were surfing. And you were oh, shit. Yeah. yeah, I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> that there we go. Don't go chasing yeah. waterfalls. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Well, so... I don't know where the transition is on this one, but I actually really want to hear, like, where... <laughs> nice choice of words. <laughs> where, um... <laughs> where, but yeah, pump. that is... Um, but seriously, folks. <laughs> where music actually came from with you. Like, was this, like, all... Like, since you were a kid? Like, is this, like, how... Where did this start? And with what instrument? Like, where are we... Where did this all begin? Yeah, like, um... My, um... It's, it's just, like, a simple little funny little story like i was in the back of i remember in the back of like you know the station wagon and um my mom's always like we had the radio on be sitting along you know and cracking a gum and i was you know making a beat on the um back of the bench seat and she's like oh you know you got the beat kid you know you should you want to play an instrument and i was like yeah i want to play guitar and and now i think I I feel like I remember that moment and um and then she put me into you know, folk guitar lessons and it was interesting because she put me in I think a big part of like my whole music's been the like because it's rooted in acoustic music um from everything from style everything that's playing um so yeah she started me on acoustic guitar which I think is a big difference um. Because, you know, acoustic guitar, especially, like, in the 80s, when you're a kid, it, it's not really cool. You know, yeah. like, it's not cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. And so 
I had acoustic guitar, and I didn't get an electric guitar until uh, I was like 15 and had been playing you know, for like seven years. Okay. Um, so like a lot of kids when they were like, you know, 12 or 13, like my manager, for instance, got a, a bright red um, Fender bullet, and it was like the coolest thing ever. And I was like, oh, you know, I got this like nylon string folk guitar. <laughs> <laughs> and uh not cool at all and um and then everyone starts learning like yeah i'm an electric guitar as well i'm gonna learn you know this is boys don't cry about the cure and, like oh it's like cool like 80s like you know undergroundish yeah music this is where the and, face um, painting thing came in with the cure yeah, right the inspiration like, of that face painting. <laughs> I, wanna, I wanna get mascara and i wanna <laughs> sing cure paint my fingernails black <laughs> Uh, but uh yeah you know um i so yeah so so and then the acoustic guitar led me to like learning singing beatles songs um nothing wrong with learning cure songs but like i was learning beatles songs and then i was learning bob dylan songs and then then i kind of got on to my own thing which was writing when i was 15 and that stylistically pushed me to kind of be like a young uh, hippied out 1988 version of uh, Bob Dylan playing a <laughs> harmonica rack when all the other kids are playing, you know, in a Cure cover band. And um, and then I played the talent show and then it was all over because once I hit the stage and got a taste for that and got the response I got, then it was like, oh, shit. Okay. <laughs> this, this, this is it. So what was your first, like, like the minute you were – sort of like stepping out on a stage and you were like, shit, I can do this with my life. Like, where was that moment and how old were you? Well, I think there's like two moments. Like one was, I didn't cut school a lot, but one I did twice. And one time I was with my little girlfriend and we were probably 10th grade, 16. I'm sitting on the side of the Society Hill Towers on this hill down there on 2nd Street. Yeah. And I'm uh, with my little girlfriend eating my bag lunch that my mom would make me with my turkey and cheese and juice box. <laughs> like a real you know, thug. Bag, <laughs> bag, bag of Doritos. And I remember saying, I remember saying to the little girl, hey, all I need is my guitar and this bag lunch. <laughs> and then I'm good. And yeah. that was kind of what I felt like. That was kind of a epiphany. Like, all right, I, I just want to play music and I'll, if I can just have this bag lunch, I know I can live off this every day. Yeah. Maybe some rice and beans, <laughs> you know. Yeah. But uh, yes, that was that. And then I think, and I, I did, I did bring up the, the high school talent show, which I did play in tenth grade, um, with my band, which is called Greenwood, which was a folk trio, which was me, and I had like wore brown corduroys and flannel shirt and had longer hair, and um, and then. A, a, sh um, a very short little um, pudgy Jewish girl named well, what was her name? But she was an amazing <laughs> singer named Wendy, and and then a straight edge Quaker skinhead named Aaron Terry oh who played the other guitar, <laughs> and wow. he played lead guitar. And so so Wendy and I sang his harmonies, and um, Aaron played a lead guitar, and it was like, and we played the talent show. And, um, man, like, seriously, it was one of the loudest crowd responses I've ever seen or heard anybody get. And it was probably the loudest one I ever got, period. And it was like, I remember being pretty nervous. And then, you know, we did it. And then I got interviewed by the school paper, like, the next week. And I remember saying in the school paper interview, I go, well, you know, I have a hard time expressing myself, like, through, you know, speaking to people. So I really find I can express myself through songwriting. Well, I didn't just make this shit up. Like this was when I was like 16 and this is like a really pure thing I was saying. So I guess that was it, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. After that, I was like, you know, after the first performance, I was getting interviewed at the school paper, man. And all I needed was my bag lunch. I was like, yeah, let's go. <laughs> I'm out of here, man. <laughs> yeah, man. I'm well, out of here. <laughs> well, so I don't want to fucking go to school. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, when you get to choose, right? No, so I think you... the, whole thing about, the whole thing about what we all do is just to figure out a way not to really have a job. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I'm an artist. <laughs> yeah. 
Jay tried a job for like 30 days and yeah, then I had that was a, it. like a real job for about two months, like yeah. my entire life. Other than that, I'm like, dude, no way. Yeah, it wasn't for him. Um, yeah, I mean, I got stuck it. So speaking of like, you know, you kind of finding your way with all this. So like, uh, you know, knowing you as we do like on stage and off, like it's, it seems like there's like G love, the writer, the performer, the rock star guy. And then there's like Garrett Dutton, you know, like the dad, the, you know, the friend, you know, all the different hats you wear, like the surfer, the, yeah, the, surfer, or the it, political so. activist, <laughs> like, you wear different roles. Like I wanted to know, I guess, first, like when the persona of G love came about and also like how like Garrett Dutton differs from G love and have they, kind of merged over the years or, or gone apart over the years as you've gotten older? So I, I, I was a little start by saying, I, I really do feel like over the last like 10 years, they they really have merged like you know, Garrett Dutton and G love. Um, and they've merged like on all aspects of my career, like creatively and also the way I'm kind of received. Cause I've always like, as you guys know, from being friends, probably the first time we met, I never, I never introduced myself as G love. I always like people will say, Hey, this is like, if, if you were to introduce me to someone, you'd probably say, Hey, you know, this is G love. And then I'd say, Hey, I'm Garrett. You know what I mean? Right. Um, and I've kind of always done that. Um, so yeah. So who's Garrett and who's G love? Well, um, they're both me. I guess they, they kind of, so musically, you know, I first started cause I was just, you know, Gary Dutton, and that was a kid that was learning how to play, you know, folk and rock and roll and blues guitar and write songs and inspired by people like, you know, Bob Dylan and Lou Reed um, and the blues. And um, I was, and then I got a hold of the blues, and then that set, and that was the, I think I spoke music was kind of a natural thing. And the, the blues thing was like a little bit of a stretch. Like our, I found this music now from a John Hammond record called country blues. And from the first note of it, I was like, that's the type of music. That's the sound I need to figure out how to make. So that was a journey into the blues, which um, was a little bit harder to get your, you know, 16, 17 year old Philadelphia Quaker white boy voice to sound like Marty Waters than it was already hard <laughs> enough to sound like Bob Dylan. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, man. So, like, then I started, like, pushing, you know, my expression and, and the way the music was hitting me, like, both physically and spiritually, trying to keep digging deeper to get this sound. And then the hip-hop thing was, like, always, like, part of growing up in Philadelphia, and that was just part of being, like, a city kid you know, it went from like basketball and break dancing to skateboarding to graffiti writing to me and then back to music, you know. Um, it's kind of a path that like a lot of kids that were, you know, growing up with me in the city did. And so the hip hop was always kind of the soundtrack to the back of that. They never thought about rapping until it just kind of happened by accident. But what did happen when I was playing on the street in Philadelphia, one in 1992 on second and lumbar and i started singing you know eric being rock and paid a full lyrics over this blues riff i was playing and i did realize oh well, that's completely original no one's like i had that moment where oh there's no other white kid sitting on the street playing acoustic guitar playing blues and rapping right now yeah, i knew it yeah you know and i was like and so that was like a real thing and it, it wasn't unnatural for me to do it because of all the things leading up to that time so that was like and then of course when it became apparent that like this is a style that i'm going to push to be called garrett dutton it didn't seem right at the time because my influences were either you know q-tip <laughs> right <KRS> one <laughs> or um you know uh, or howlin wolf and um you know Mississippi John Hurt. So it, it needed to be like You a needed stage a street name. name. So, yeah. Yeah. I need a I need a street name, a stage name that was both hip hop and blues, and that's how the name G Love and Special Sauce came about. And then that and then that the naming of it became like the persona thing. So I'll just keep going real quick. So 
all, all, there's, and then there's also the stage. Like, so when we approach the stage and I think, um, as a band, um, Jim's kind of played along with us, um, Jeff and I, especially like, um, you know, have always like approached the stage like, Oh, it's the show coming up. So when it's your show time, you know, you take off your everyday clothes and now you put on, you know, your stage clothes, like your superhero costume. Yeah. And then yeah. you get up on stage and you're displaying, you're making a presentation, which has everything to do with like the way your ear looks to, you know, the way you talk into the microphone to the, the music you play and everything else. Right. So it's like you're becoming somebody different, somebody greater, somebody magic, you know, and, and then that whole stage person comes in. So, yeah, there's two things, the stylistic intro, the hip hop, everything. Now, over the years, because my career's been going along as it has, I've gotten to kind of go back and say, OK, on some records, I've gone back and said, OK, Look, you know, I know you guys know the hip hop side of what it, but this is really like where it started. Like when the Fix and the Die record kind of came back out with a lot of songs I actually wrote in that high school time. So they've always kind of the, musically, I've been able to trickle back in like the original thing. And then the last thing I'll say, like the last 10 years, I've done a lot more solo acoustic shows. And certainly, you know, that's how Jay and I and Chelsea, we all met like doing those type of shows. And those type of shows, um, even more so I've been able to kind of bridge like who Garrett Dutton and, you know, G love are musically and, and make a full like completion. So I do feel like now, like 25 years into it, like, um, both, both, um, kind of, you know, myself and like the, the G love spirit of like whatever the original hip hop, Philly kid, G Love is a, like, like merging in, like combined. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was cool. I do have to say to see you um, in full rock star mode. We realized when we saw you at See Here Now um, this summer that that was the first time we'd seen you with full band in a while because you'd been doing that Algonquin show here and like a lot of solo stuff. Oh, so yeah. It was really, really fun. The yeah, kids were dope. out of their minds excited. Yeah, it was a really good show. Oh, cool. Um, but I wanted to ask on that evolvement of your career. So a lot of people sort of came to know you in modern times <laughs> because of Jack Johnson. So you did those, you know, shows with him. And I love how you merge your sort of hip hop style into his more surfy sound. But has that been something that you started to incorporate in? Like, are you inspired by that sound or do you just like laying your stuff over top of it? Like, is that, do you find yourself in that scene more? Well, I mean, I think like the, the music between Jack and I has been a really interesting thing and his kind of effect on the music of the, of the music that have kind of inspired him. Like <clears throat> it's pretty profound. It first came out like, um, you know, I, I think, you know, if you ask Jack, like he would tell you like one of his big influences was like our third record, the G love. Yeah. It's that easy record. And I think you can really hear the basis of his sound in that record, like on the, on like the grooves on like, you know, I 76 and stepping stones and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You know, absolutely. Th that's kind of a predecessor beat to like, cause Jack's rhythm. So if you, if you look at stepping stones and I 76, like it's just one little accent away from kind of getting to that strum pattern. So, so yeah, we influenced Jack, and then of course Jack came through and and became Jack, this legend, and and you know just has come. He's a wonderful writer, a wonderful singer, guitar player, everything. You know, stage presence, and obviously a huge philanthropist as well, which has been unbelievable to be a part of um, seeing that. Um, yeah, no, well, I love that description because I think that's what a lot of people don't realize is that you were around like 15 years before Jack could have hit the scene. And when you guys combined, it was like magic. Like you guys just made some real magic happen. Which is yeah, I think cool. it's cool how like, how, how, gee, I think it's amazing how you've like crossed over into so many like subcultures of music. Like you are, you and your music are like equally fitting in like the Jack Johnson, you know, jam band world as as you are with like a more of a like a punk ska scene as you are with like a blues scene and like somehow like your stuff just organically fits in all these different things and i think that 
comes down to like you being really authentic in your process and like always seeking to like stay true to like your creative process and your roots and your inspiration, how it's, it's just so cool how it kind of fits in all of those different subcultures. Yeah. We were talking before this, that like some of the coolest things for us to watch is when you guys are backstage, like sorting it out, because it's like always amazing to us that you may not see each other, like whoever you're working with, whether it's like, you know, Zach and Jack's crew or whoever you can sit down and just listening to you work and like create something in 10 minutes that you're like, yeah, this sounds good. This sounds good. It's like blows our minds every time. It's amazing. Yeah. I mean, it's just, well, I mean, just real quick back to the Jack thing. Like when he, when he, so he came through doing his thing and then he was able to really get to know like me and Ben Harper kind of helped him out a lot early on in his career. And we both had influenced him. And then to see Jack come out and make such a strong presentation that he came right back and influenced off. So you, I think you could clearly see, like, after Jack came out, you could see my record change. And you could see Ben's record change. Because you could see, like, Ben come, came out with his song, like, I'll Steal My Kisses, which is kind of like a G. Lovey, Jack Johnson kind of thing. True. After Jack's thing hit. And then, you know, you can also see my record start to change with, like, the hustle. Um, was a record, the, our first Bucks Fly record, and of course the first release I made since after Jack got really big, and I was strongly influenced by Jack on that record. Um, trying to do a lot of like call and response stuff, a lot of really hooky courses for me, um, and stuff that was clearly guided to people singing, uh, singing along and, and making the connection and kind of jangly. So I think it's really interesting to see how music is continuously um, you know, building off of, of itself and no one invented anything. It's like, you know, you're, you're being a part of a, of the ongoing flow, right? You're just another drop in this creative river and you're sharing everything that came before you is pushing you along and, and, and you're pushing along the next bit of water. So uh, it's interesting, but you know, like, and to that point, like as far as, so where does genres, one genre end and one, and one genre begins? Well, I mean, this day and age, it's harder and, and harder to find or find it necessary to have the walls between styles uh, and everything. And that goes with everything in life. It's like it's all from communication and availability. We were able to see, hear, and often touch like, things that we could only dream about years ago or never even had the opportunity to be, you know, engaged by. So yeah. it's like everything is constantly flowing. And, and that's why, like, you know, on any given day, I could, I could be at a festival. I could go, you know, get on stage and rap with uh, Nas. And then I could go play some harmonica behind the Aider brothers. And, um, yeah. and it would both be, it would both be me, you know, doing my thing in a completely, natural way and that's just because you know because being born and growing up where i did and um and this just or one being born and growing up where they did and, and the time that they are you're able to know and really connect with all these different influences yeah well i think that's why it's always been even so so jay and i were both huge fans of yours before we even met like 15 years ago but we you're so relatable to so many people listening to music because like for us, I don't know if it's the Northeast or what it is, but like we can easily shift into like rap and hip hop, but then we love punk rock. Like it's like we can just go fluidly and then we're listening to classical music while we're in the house. It's just, it's awesome to hear you be able to shift into all of this stuff, you know? Hey G, can I ask you like a nerdy uh, music performance question? Um, yeah. So I've been fortunate enough to like, you know, be at your shows, be backstage, kind of see some of your process. But I'm wondering, like, I, I've seen like your arsenal of uh, harmonicas, right? So like when you're doing your set lists and, and you're determining what songs to do, do you base it around like a certain key of harmonica? Like if you have a harmonica in your holder at the time, that's in a key of G, do you, are you like, all right, the next three th songs I should do around this key? Or do you just swap them out? Or do you transpose the songs on the fly to like, to fit that, to make the process and the performance more of a smooth transition? Like, how does that work? Well, actually, I'd say it's kind of the opposite because um, with a lot of times on stage, like, I'm struggling to actually switch keys, you know, because, yeah. because um, 
it, it like a lot, I, um, and different musicians feel differently about this, but like a mild bass player, Timo was especially hit me to this. He's like, you don't want to play too many songs. Just say you start your first songs in the key of C. Well, you don't want to play the next 10 songs in the key of C. You want to, you want to change this, this, the tonic sound so that you can make people's ears do something different, right? So okay. if not, people kind of get lulled into a thing. Um, so, yeah. So actually, it's it's more of a thing like a time to swap harmonicas and, you know, get a different sound going. Um, but yeah, I mean, the physical thing of swapping harmonicas really, really easily. Um, so it's not, that's never something like that that's going to choose like which song I go to unless that's the only harmonica I got. <laughs> right. <laughs> you just make that shit work. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. And then we're going to stick in that one key for you. Yeah. <laughs> this is a show in the key of G. Here we yeah. go, everyone. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Here we go. <laughs> so I, I know like you're, you're, you're like super into like vinyls and like you and I are basically the exact same age. So we kind of grew up in the same era of music. And I grew up like looking at my dad's vinyls and like every record I would pull out, whether it was like, uh, you know, whether it was Michael Jackson's Thriller or whether it was like, you know, Beatles or whatever, I'd like look at it as a whole experience. Like people nowadays, like kids these days, um, it seems like, you know, they, they just hit, damn kid. <laughs> damn kids. they're just like hitting shuffle. They're like hit, hitting a button, like create me a station in the next five milliseconds. That is everything that I like. So like I, I, I wanted to, so you mentioned like fixing to die, which I like freaking love that album. And like, uh, you know, you, you know, created that album with the title and based on a song by Bucka White from the night, I think it was like the early 1940s. Right. And, um, yeah. I'm like wondering like how your process of putting together each album, like does, has it remained like creating an experience for you? Do you have like a backlog of songs that are just waiting for like the perfect home? Like you're waiting for like the next album where they fit on, or if like you're on the bus and you've worked out this six song, but like your next album doesn't at all fit with that theme of the song. Do you right. wait? Like, yeah. how, how does that work, man? Yeah, actually I'm just in that right now. I'm making a record with Kimbo right now. So I'm really excited about, um, but of course, this this always happens too. You start working on a record, and then you say, "Oh man," you start you start getting in the flow. And at first, you only had a couple songs, and then you're really flowing, and then you just start coming up with more with more. Charlie, my dog's running. Charlie, <laughs> um. You start coming up with more and more songs because, like, you got this whole direct. Try get over here. You got this whole <laughs> get over here, goddamn. You got this whole direction going. So you you have like, and you can only put, you know, geez, I mean, I guess you could put as many songs as you want, but you know, you, you, you it's wise to stick around, you know, ten to thirteen songs for a record. Like, how much people can people take? You know, what I mean. Um. So yeah, you know, like um you're at a point where you get more songs and then you got a stylistic direction, like Jay said, and then you start, well, some other, then you get a whole different thing going halfway down this project. So actually yeah, I have this thing right now where that's why it's good to have like your next project in mind while you're working on something in case you do get some overflow. So anyway, I got a record I'm doing Kevmo right now, which is the, you know, decidedly more blues oriented stuff. And then in the meantime, Cope, Citizen Cope and I have been talking, you know, it's kind of just brushing the subject of getting in the studio and, and doing some tracks and Ooh, him producing me. that would be good. So, I want to hear it. <laughs> yeah, well, well, that's perfect for me because now I got, like, for when I'm in the in a state of mind where I start, like, flowing and doing more, like, of a hip-hop style thing, I I got some... I got like an outlet in my head, like, oh, that could be cool for the cope thing. And then, you know, this one's good for the Kev Mo thing. I guess the final point on that subject, it's, a, it's an important one. And it's a mistake that like I've made in my career. <clears throat> Just talking about that record, The Hustle again. That was like the last record that was like reviewed by Rolling Stone. And um, I thought that record was going to be like a huge record for me. And it, it, it was just 
a, a small commercial success, although the fans seem to like it a lot. Um, but the Rolling Stone Review said this. They said, um, um, completely sincere, but utterly unfocused. And what it meant was like, like all the songs are sincere and well played, blah, blah, blah. But like the, the entire record was unfocused because it didn't have a direction. The reason it didn't have a direction is because I was trying to do everything that I do on that record. I was trying to do hip hop. I was trying to do blues. I was trying to do like, um, you know, kind of my newer stuff that was influenced by Jack after Jack just came out. I was trying to, do reggae. I was trying to do rock and roll. I did every, if you listen to that record, you really see, holy shit, like it is like all these different styles and they're all together on one record. So I felt like that was a mistake and that was not a mistake that I want to make again on a record, like trying to display everything I can do on a record. It's not necessarily like, let's just take it into one shade of what I can do. Cause I could do the next record next year and come back to that different thing. You know what I mean? But now when I do a record, I try to like focus on what it's going to be. Was that like a lesson that kind of come, comes back to the other question we had for you, which is like, you know, if you ever wanted to create like a different, almost like a different persona and you're like, here's my gangster rap album or here's my like, you know, right. uh, you know, that, that kind of is a lesson I would imagine that would have stuck with you. Like stick to one thing, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah, no, it did. And, and, and um, that's the thing about the side project things and then why some, why oftentimes they don't, you don't hear about them because it's just like anything else. Like there's only so many hours in the day and there's only so many days in a year. Like there's only so much time to do all this stuff, these creative ideas we want to do. So you kind of have to. Yeah. That's like know. Jay's biggest. Like if you yeah. are hearing him like complain about anything, it's because he just has so many ideas in these magic books of just like jotting yeah. and he can't make them all happen. And it's so stressful. Yeah. It's like fucking maddening. You're like, come on, I have like <laughs> 4,000 paintings. I only have time for like a hundred. Right. Like, <laughs> well, yeah. Was, yeah, I was thinking it's actually cause the, some of this, the sketch that he did the other night, like when we were all backstage at Jack's show, like, that that was kind of reminded me of like oh this could be another because I think one of the classic ones well I think it's one of your classic paintings and one of my favorites is the painting that, that you did of us in Brazil with Donovan Matt Costa Zach Gill and I like jamming out and you captured this whole um, scene and you captured like everyone's personalities like perfectly and in the um, and the picture is like a really cool painting, especially if you knew like the intricacies of like all the, the jams and the hangs that led up to that. And then the sketch you did, like, like you did some sketches backstage at Jack's thing the other night. So I, yeah, like hearing you say that, I can imagine like you must have a million sketches that could all turn into these epic paintings, but you obviously can't maybe find time to paint all of them, all these ideas. <laughs> speaking about that like painting from brazil that we did so like you know so at that t i don't know what that tour was like from your experience but from my experience that was 2007 and like that was my first like experience in that in that world that you, that is your home that you know that music touring thing and like for for me at the time like you and donovan and matt and like jack like you guys were like a lot of the people that I was playing on my playlist. So for me, like I growing up at the same time as you did, I also romanticized the era of like the sixties, like the seventies, like seeing pictures and books of like Bob Dylan hanging out in cafes in the village or like seeing Hendrix hanging out with, you know, like, Bob, you know, John Lennon or whatever, like Andy Warhol hanging out oh. in these backstage clubs. So like for me, that moment seeing you guys jam at that house in Brazil was like the closest that I had ever come to like feeling like I was in a significant historical moment of music history. Like for me, like watching you guys oh, cool. do what you did was like akin to like Trent going back in time, sitting in a cafe and seeing Hendrix doing one of his performance at a, at a blues club or something, you know, you know what I mean? It was like a very magical yeah. moment. And like, yeah. you know, it, it, I think holding on to some of that magic is like really important for like creative people. Like even after like experiences or meeting people it becomes almost normalized. I think it's super important to like hold on to that other part of your persona. That's like, you know what? This is fucking magical. This whole experience I'm right. having. 
Yeah, which for the record, um, Garrett, we like had Bob and Yona on as our first guest. And like even in his like history books, that moment was magic. And we just did our interview with Romeo from Romeo. Romeo. Yeah. Romeo. Oh, cool. From down there. And he's the same way. Like that year and that show was just pure magic for all of them. And so to talk to all these different people that all were just witness to it, it was like, yeah. it's really cool to hear. Yeah, that was that was a really cool trip, and uh, yeah, it really was. It kind of was like, in a lot of ways, it was kind of the peak, or, or a peak of the you know the Brush Fire Records vibe. Well, that that certainly was. It was like a time when everything was kind of intact. That whole family. Yeah, I mean, you had like the Lemonade album was like out then. Like, yeah, Matt was still out oh, and right. about. And... I mean, yeah, it was like sick. I remember being on like. One of the last um, legs of the tour, you were doing like "Can't Go Back to Jersey," and like you were doing busting out some of the uh, new songs from like the Lemonade album, and it just seemed like there was like magic in the air. Like I remember when you were on stage, there was like the other members of the bands would like come on and watch you, and it there yeah. was a camaraderie. It was like it was sick, you know. Actually, I'm, yeah, and on that tour too, I I remember I wrote that song "Peace, Love, Happiness" because I was like watching Donovan's show and his connection with the Brazilian and kind of like the kind of a simplified lyrical message and that and kind of like from being with Donnie. Yeah, so, they love um, him down there. Yeah. The Brazilians are big Donnie fans, that's for sure. Oh yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's it's cool. But yeah, I guess I guess just back to that point, like there's only there's so much we can all do and, and that's why I guess we, we work as hard as we can. And that's why it's interesting just to bring Picasso back up. It was about like the creative process, but like we just we were just on tour in, in Europe and went to the Picasso Museum. It's just interesting. And talking about Jay and, and all the sketches you have and how many of them will actually become full paintings and stuff. It's like I mean the guy's body of work was just unbelievable and like yeah. the amount of that he did and you know, just I guess that really does have a lot to do with the creative process is just you know, people's work ethic and constantly pushing yourself to, to put more and more hours into it because as a thing about any creative creative pursuit is that like it's ultimately it's just about this journey and, and pushing yourself because you know it's obviously not about the money and it's obviously um you know not about what you've done before it's always about like what the next thing is going to be and just making time to keep <clears throat> pushing your craft you know yeah more about that big evolution is really it's like the big the big story you're leaving behind um yeah, yeah. so with that said as we're kind of starting to get to a close i wanted to ask you one question um so what band or musician past or present would you love to be able to sit with um well i mean you mentioned Jimi hendrix earlier so i'm gonna say Jimi hendrix that'd be pretty pretty right pretty the jam with Jimi Hendrix. I just um, yeah. I actually just saw a thing about him. I don't know. It might even have been in Rolling Stones. I don't know. But I just saw a thing written about him that was saying that the the most talented thing about Jimi Hendrix was that he knew when not to overperform. So he knew like he could always give more, but he would always do less, and that was actually what made him a good musician. Oh, that's very cool. You had mentioned before about like um, hustle. You thought it would like take off, and then you said you know it got some lackluster reviews from Rolling Stone, but the fans liked it. It's it's obviously an awesome album. I was wondering like uh, how good you've you've gotten at predicting how well songs would do. Like, can you give us an example of like some songs that you're like, yeah, this is going to be the next biggest fucking thing ever, and like it didn't go anywhere. And then maybe there were some songs that you were like, oh, it's a, it's a cool song, but it's not my favorite. And it just like became a, right. fan, a fan favorite. And you're like, oh, that was a surprise. Like, Yeah, I guess that's kind of been my whole career. Like I'm really bad at this, which is <laughs> <laughs> why I'm probably like have uh, achieved the level of success I had, which is great, but always room for growth. But um, yeah, like, okay. Um, Obviously, the first record, when we finished it, I was terribly embarrassed by it. I, I really felt like we had missed capturing like the magic that I was feeling that was going down to live shows then, which was really kind of powerful time of like this explosion of something that was as special as we were doing right when it was happening and like in our full like youth and glory. 
and everything was there. And I felt like we just missed capturing the lightning and the ball that was happening on stage. Now, of course, looking back, I was wrong. I think we captured just the right amount of, of magic that we couldn't have captured all that energy. It would have sounded maybe differently and maybe not as laid back. So I, I feel like over time I realized, oh, well, that record, which at first I was embarrassed by, is really a complete classic. So I was kind of wrong about that one. Yeah. And then the hustle to bring up the hustle was like 2001. And it was just a time in my career, like after I'd seen Jack, you know, we had just kind of put Jack on and then we got dropped by Sony. Right. Um, like the year after. <clears throat> and I gave that A&R guy that I was like, you should sign this kid, Jack Johnson. And he didn't. Oh my and God. That Seriously? Might have been, <laughs> and that kind of messed I kind of messed up his career big time, which kind of probably led to him. I was getting dropped, <clears throat> but, um, you know, so I'm, I'm watching this kid that I just helped put on basically become like one of the biggest stars in the world. And I'm basically like uh, unemployed, you know what I mean? Um, so that was like a tough time. And then we put together the hustle and it was like, the hustle was like a couple of years without a deal and really putting like everything I had into it. And it was a real like statement album for me. Um, and I felt really good about it. And I felt like that song astronaut, which is the first single was going to be like the biggest fucking smash hit ever. <laughs> and <clears throat> yeah, maybe it could have been, if it was produced differently or whatever, but, or performed differently, but anyhow, it wasn't, I mean, it, it wasn't a, a good single for us. Probably because, like, the core audience is probably like, well, this isn't what I really want from G-Love, you know? <laughs> um, and um, so that was, like, a big disappointment because I was, like, oh, picking out which house I'm going to buy, like, on the waterfront house in Avalon, New Jersey. Oh, yeah, I'm going to get this one next year because I'm going to have this yeah. hit record, you know? And that didn't happen. And then the next record, Lemonade, was just the opposite. Like, I had kind of just been like well lemonade record we were making and i didn't feel like it was very like challenging um or you know very progressive i felt like it was really laid back medium tempo stuff which is what i kind of wanted it to be but i didn't feel like it was the greatest thing ever and then of course that record ended up hitting pretty big and like this song beautiful we do with tristan bunch of number one on the radio and a bunch of places and that went that whole record went to number two on the itunes charts it was like a top 40 record on billboard um and i'm thinking man why this record like the hustle <laughs> yeah. the one you know like because that it was just had, like, easily big, digestible like, for people song. Yeah, I think it was yeah, like, it yeah, was... it was radio friendly. And like, I mean, it's a great album. Like, were you I mean, so yeah. hearing your perspective on that, I find so fascinating because I, I love that album. Um, like, I like all of yours and it is more radio friendly. Were you like tempted to be like, shit, I need a few more like lemonade formulas in my albums to get like on the back on the on the on the uh, charts? Like, was that like a temptation for you or were you yeah. like, no, nah, fuck well, that, you know? Like, yeah, well, no, definitely. Because then the next record was Superhero Brother which was like a disaster. And this is a real, another interesting thing because this record, I was like, well, I felt like on a lemonade record, I felt like I didn't really put anything into this record. This kind of, you know, half of it we wrote in the studio. Um, you know, half of it was written by other people. Like, you know, like, um, let the music play. It was like just a groove. We had the studio. So Ben Harper came in and wrote his verse. You know what I mean? Right. And then it became a song. And then like, um, you know, the song Banger was with Black Alicious. Like, it was just a groove and a hook. And these guys put this amazing thing on. <clears throat> there was a lot <clears throat> of collaboration, like with Tristan, Pretty Men, and Jasper. But there was a lot of other voices on that, <clears throat> excuse me, on that record, which was to his benefit. Superhero Brother, I was like, man, I'm going to really know what the hell I'm doing on this record. Man, I spent like months putting together this record and making these fancy demos and I had all my guitar parts and my second guitar parts and my third guitar parts all of this shit orchestrated out and all these different things and everything and then we recorded it and it went so smooth because everything was all together 
And, you know, excuse me, it came out and it was just like, no. And, and I was like, well, these songs have big hooks and, you know, it's got, it's challenging to play, but it's still radio friendly. I thought I just really considered everything and put in all the work. And the only thing that was missing was, I don't know what's missing. I don't know what was missing, but it didn't connect and it didn't have the something that it needed to, to push over the hump. And even though, you know, peace, love and happiness was like another single that I presented that I thought this is going to be a great big time single for us with a great message. And it just didn't work. And, it, and, and, and now, nowadays, now, you know, after it's been out for 12 years, I think people have come around to, liking that song pretty good but um again i guess long story short is we could talk about this for every record because you you see that you can only thing you can do is just do the best job and try to be as real and connected and electric as you can and i mean like electricity from within <clears throat> uh, when you're making whatever you're making and you can't really tell what's going to happen after that because like there's times when you think you got a gold nugget and people flush down the toilet and then there's times when <laughs> you took a big shit and everybody <laughs> took it on a silver platter and said this is the greatest thing ever isn't it crazy yeah, I, think- I think just from the outside perspective because i'm you know i don't make music or art but i watching jay's process and then it's always similar that the ones that he's making personal growth on and he's just like i like he needs like a 10 day nap after finishing these paintings that take everything out of him that gave his whole heart and soul. Yeah. Those might just like hit the wall and it's just like, no one sees what he sees in it. But then other ones that he's just like, I whipped this up and he'll, we'll look and right. it'll just be like an attack. Like everyone's crazy about it. So it's really, it's fascinating. Right. You can't predict it. It's a all. frustrating process because like for me, it's like, I do have other areas of interest with my art that I would love to explore like outside of what I'm expected and uh-huh. my my personal preferred process is kind of slow like i like i like painting slow because i like the journey of it all and then i'll i'll take time i'll put everything into it and then it's just like eh no one really received it so it kind of like puts you in this place of like all right well i, I guess i'll just keep doing what people love love to see and it's like a tough like balance because obviously you want to make a living and obviously i love doing all the paintings that i do so it's not like torture by any sure. means but i i would like to have some like freedom to like do more. And I guess that's what we all strive for is to like get enough notoriety and interest. And uh, so we can buy ourselves the freedom to like do other things and people will still be cool with it. I mean, it's, it's a, it's an excellent point. I mean, I mean, I can't tell you how many, I mean, on the real to real, like, yeah, there's two points. One is that, Sometimes the really simple stuff that comes out really quickly is the best stuff. Um, and it's so pure and and people react to it in such a way. But make no mistake, it, it only came out that easily because you put, you know, countless hours and hours and hours into your craft leading up to that point where all of a sudden, you know, you could just pick up your paintbrush or a paint marker and I could just pick up a guitar and like, oh, that's the hit. The, the biggest hit we've written in five years. It just happened, you know, right now at the party, you know, or whatever. Yeah. I mean, that that's from all the work. And then the other thing is, like, same time, <clears throat> I don't know how many times, you know, um, straight up, like, I've spent trying to figure out, like, all right, why is a cold beverage, like, so fucking um, popular, <laughs> yeah. you know? Like, w- what is it about? Let me dissect this song. Well, it, it is like a very perfect song like the way that somehow I did this in like two seconds like back in 1992 I don't know how the hell I did it but it's like a perfect song with like the way the music is moving and these little riffs and everything else and how did that shit come about I don't know and then to try and like recreate it well it was like lightning in the ball it's like you can't you can't recreate up and you can you can learn from it like well what makes this transition from this verse group to this chorus group work well you can figure out well these chords sound good next to each other these paints 
these colors are always going to work next to each other. You know, you should mix these colors is going to make brown. Yeah. Yeah, but don't you see um, that? So, like, I feel like, especially in music, that so many musicians get so that's such a trap. Like, if you fall into that trap of obsessing over what's working in one hit, like the one hit you had, then you'll never create anything new. And that's not what your fans want either, you know? So it's like, it really, I mean, we have so many friends that are musicians that we hear them say that, like trying to dissect themselves and other musicians, like there's some magic formula, but it doesn't start, exist. Like, emulating yourself instead of like right. having your own voice. Instead of finding that magic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a constant thing to kind of, you always kind of have to, police yourself and i think the other part of that that is like hey look you know what at least you you found you found that thing that that worked you don't always find that every time you sit down it's not necessary to and it's not like um there's got to be times where things are more challenging to create and you know it just takes more out of you than others because yeah that that's how you get a your work becomes deeper and sometimes you have to have that process of just like banging your head against the wall unsuccessfully and it could be a day of that it could be months of that and that always all those times like create always who we are as creative people you know um, I have a question on process. So my, my medium is art, visual arts, mostly yours is primarily music. And like those differ in a lot of ways, but one way is like my process involves a lot of me locking in my studio. I love painting by myself. I, I like kind of keeping it to myself until it's time to unveil, but like your medium involves like something that people can hear in the room next door. Like it's not, it's kind of harder to like for you to hide or keep secret what you're doing is, is it ever important to you when you're creating to like, keep it on the hush until it's time to release or like from the very get go where you're like, Hey, Kels, what do you think about this song? Like we've been on the bus with you and you've been like working out new songs. And as a visual artist, that seems really vulnerable to me to like, here's something new. What do you think? Because I, for me, I really like primarily keeping my stuff like very much me in the painting and that's it. And when it's time to release, I like that feeling of like, here it is. Like, is there ever a moment in your creative process of songwriting where you keep it just you in a room before anyone hears it? Well, yeah, I mean, there's always like the, the writing process of, um, you know, kind of working something up. Um, it, it's interesting. Like now, I guess there's, it's kind of tough. Like a lot of times when I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking about like the summer or, we got two things at the same time, but I guess I was working on the record with Cat Mo. Um, I'll play stuff for like Kelsey. Obviously, since we're just like always together, so I listen to mixes a lot in the car. So I'll play it for her. Like, you know, she's, you know, should be really supportive. And she, she's just kind of a fan, anyhow. So she likes the music, um, which is always helpful. And, um, but like I I I don't remember really like sending out mixes to people, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, like you know, like I don't really want to hear like you know, well, what is what is the label and, and these guys are all my friends anyhow. What do my manager? What do these guys think about these songs? Or you know, what's their opinion on it? You know, like I don't really give a fuck right now because I'm just like so enjoying. Yeah. The mixes and I know that they're really good and um and that time can come when people can say, Oh well that song's just you know, okay. I mean ultimately like, <laughs> anybody that listens or listens to me or sees your art for the first time is gonna feel it as uniquely powerfully as we did and as probably as much as hopefully we both enjoyed, you know, the the process and, and being finished and, you know, I mean, if I'm really hyped on a track, like, I, I love it. Like, when I finish a record or finish making a demo and you get that rough mix and you get the, oh, man, this is, like, the greatest thing ever. And, and even, you know what, even if it's not, even if you just think it is at that week or that day or that moment, that's cool because that's the moment we live for. You know what I mean? And then once you send it out to everyone else, they say, oh, well, you know, this, this chorus isn't catching up or this song's too long or this part's 
should come out or you should add something like this in or why don't you say it like this? Then you say, oh, well, okay, yeah, let me try all that stuff. Um, but there's something about keeping it to yourself. Yeah, but then it kind of messes same the time, process up. Yeah, at the same time, like, it's cool to have some people that you can sound stuff off of, like, you know, we kind of wrote the cave, and um, it's interesting, because I'm kind of, like, you know, I'm older now, but I've made, like, a really, like, kind of, it's hard to make friends with, I think, it's hard to make close, close, and closer friends with older, yeah, you know, but you do, you, you make close friends with, yeah, I made, like, a really close friend the last couple of years, my buddy Adrian, and uh, he's, like, my best friend down here, and, like, you know, he's, like, a really he's one of these guys like i just love his spirit and um i, I would like kind of kick songs off him to see if they kind of hit him in it because he feels like a very pure kind of um guy like his soul's kind of pure to me so i can tell kind of oh what does he think about this like is this kind of does he think this is cool because if he does i think it's probably pretty cool you know what i mean yeah yeah you need so I, will, those people. Like, I do have like a yeah i have some people that i can kind of bounce ideas up because I know it can be judgmental but I can see like is it connecting with them or not you know what I mean yeah like Jay doesn't let me see a painting until it's done like other people might see it in the process like for to, to like do videos or photos or whatever but then he wants to see my actual genuine reactions because he can totally tell if I'm like that's amazing or if I'm like cool <laughs> <laughs> yeah I like live for those moments like to, to be completely done and then have her walk in the room or have people I love seeing people's reaction for the first time I like and I, I try to avoid showing people in the process unless I'm just doing a sketch like if I'm like if I'm like inebriated and doing a quick sketch around people or if I'm doing like a live painting with you like that's a totally different type of a painting a different process and I'm cool with that but like if it's a passion project or a painting that I love I, I don't like people's too many cooks in the kitchen because then I feel like it's going to like influence or hinder my process I'll start questioning myself even more than I already do so it gets messy I want to just talk a little bit about I know you're super into street art we you know you post a lot about it you have a lot of um, artists that you follow we're always jealous because you get to go to down to Miami every year to be a part of that big event and um I want to hear where that came from. Like, I know that it's streets of Philadelphia and all of that, but you started doing it yourself too. So when did that start? Yeah. Like, um, well, you know, uh, I kind of like dabbled in graffiti writing when I was a kid, although I wasn't very good, but we used to go out there with our spray paint and magic markers and stuff. And, <clears throat> you know, do that. And, um, and then like, so when you're doing that graffiti, right, you're basically like writing, you're pra always practicing your tag, you know? So, like, since I was, like, 15, you, know, you, you look at all my old school books, like, tag after tag, and I used to, like, look. Hello, okay. <clears throat> and, um, you know, write thousands of times practicing your tag. And then that translated, like, when I came to G-Love, so I started doing, like, tagging, like, G-Love everywhere. And then if you were in a band that plays, like, a lot of shitty clubs, like I have for the last... You know, 25 years, then you're going to see G Love written on the backstage, and, like all these little clubs all around the world. And then, um, and then, um, so yeah, so then the, so I've always kind of like been into art like that. And then my, my parents, <clears throat> my father, like, he was into art and he was not a huge collector, but he's a small collector and he would like be friends. There's a particular Brazilian artist out of Philadelphia, this guy named Fernando, Berjo Fernando. And um, he's done all right, but my father kind of befriended him in the 80s and actually commissioned like a family portrait. And we have another one of big paintings. So I remember like sitting for him. And and then <clears throat> um, and then my father also had this piece by this guy, James Havard, which has been a big influence on me, kind of like a contemporary artist who's still living is really good um so there's that aspect of and then actually jason brown my manager his mother was actually an art dealer so his, his mother's question is unbelievable i mean she's got like you know um the coonings and like carl appels and all this stuff in the house but i didn't really realize what it was till like yeah. later but um you know, I was seeing that stuff every day after school. So there was, so then fast forward, like I started playing some gigs down at this art basketball event in Miami. And 
the first year I played, I played this exhibition and met this really cool artist from New York named Greg Haberney, and I bought a couple of his pieces. I basically, that started thing like every time I go to New York, I mean, I'd go to Miami and play these gigs. Any money that I took from these gigs, I'd, I'd buy um, some visual, you know, some paintings um, by artists, by up and coming artists. And I figured, like, you know, I, art really sparks me. Like, um, to me, it's like a really profound thing. And the way, like, a painting can connect um, with me and, and, draw me in and like over and over again at different times so to be able to like um build our collection and like have all these kind of really profound paintings some by established artists and some by up-and-coming artists and all different kind of styles to when i come off the road even though i'm just home for days at a time to be able to sit you know, in the house and like look around and see all these, these are literally like speaking to me, you know, from the walls and affecting my, my, my mood and my like inner creative spark. I like to surround myself with that. So it's been a big part of that. And then, you know, just, and then of course, like I have, um, and then you, you are a big part of helping me to put out my own stuff. Um, you kind of recognize the set list that I do for my shows as like something that's cool and like kind of worthy. So thank you for that because, you know, obviously um, for people that didn't know, like you did my first show where someone actually invited me to say, Hey, you, your set lists are like art. Come sell them. <laughs> and so I did. That was such a fun show. Yeah, that was awesome. That and then the chairs. We still have the one chair. Yeah, the, the chair that yeah. you uh, the chair that you gave me is is the chair that I paint on. So yeah, it's, it's like your your uh, uh, no, it. so yeah cool. your art <laughs> is like a daily inspiration for me. And uh, I, when I oh. you know I remember when that moment came, we were actually surfing. I think it was like Lock Arbor, and we were in the lineup. And I remember like I remember talking to you about that. Like, let's do an art show, and you're like, what? And uh, it turned out really well, like for you. And it's been great to see like people appreciate that because like I grew up like in, a, in the same time and like I grew up like listening to like Houdini and Run DMC and like the Fat Boys and like, you know, I, we kind of having that uh, that street vibe, even though I was in the suburbs, which was kind of cheesy. We, yeah. had, like, a, we yeah. had like a break dance crew and I had a street name and my windbreaker. And so I appreciate the graffiti thing and like to um, have that opportunity to show your work was really cool. Yeah, I mean that was that was really cool, and and actually today, I'm actually doing a project today because I'm doing um, start painting a new stage backdrop for this year's winter tour. So I went to Blick yesterday and spent like you know four hundred dollars on spray paint. And, yeah, man, all the people realize how expensive paint is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no joke, bro. <laughs> it is no That's joke. True. I mean, I can only imagine how much you spend on paint Jesus. and art supplies a year because I just dropped, you know, four four hundred bucks. Um, and that's just for like a weekend warrior like myself, but. We're going to put paint, out there paint, that Garrett paint. needs a, uh, a paint sponsor. You need some special sauce <laughs> paint sponsor. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's so cool. Like, um, you know, like, so I really, man, thank you guys oh, for giving you, me that chance. And it's really something um, that's important. And actually, I, I think it's one of my missions in life to, like, inspire people, anybody to make, not just play music, but try and make it in music. And you guys kind of, did the same thing to me like with art like hey you know look you're already doing this go ahead gee go play in the art playground with the other children <laughs> you know and i was like no i'm over here in the musician's playground but you guys kind of gave me that confidence and it's cool because now we we sell the set list at every show i've posted close to 500 um hand-drawn set list with the hashtag g love set list on instagram and those are just the ones that are like documented. And I've now stopped kind of in the chairs and I do more like I get old canvas frames and from the thrift store and I paint over these old pictures of cats and, and landscapes. Well, hopefully no one's upset, but, um, and I do like my love paintings and, and I actually like sell the work and, it's fun because it, then I can go back to Blick and spend 500 bucks on <laughs> all the money you just got. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, if we're if we're gonna be sappy before we end, I gotta thank you too because like you know you've opened a lot of opportunities for me. You've been like super generous with like whenever you're in town, like allowing me the the honor of like coming on stage with you and doing live painting. And you've like introduced me to like influential uh, friends. So like you know the thanks and the gratitude goes goes both ways. It's like really reciprocal, and I'm like super appreciative for all you've done for me too, bro. Well, I'm just happy that the uh, that the story and the uh, everything is is continuing. So yeah, man. many many more uh, many more fun times. Well, so we have one more question, but if we're being sappy, I want to thank you for putting a ring on that girl because yeah, I certainly do. Go. I like the Kelsey Chelsea Kelsey Chelsea combo, so I'm happy to keep her around. <laughs> um, yeah, right on. <laughs> so our last question that we like to ask everyone is just: if I had to drop you right back in your childhood kitchen, tell me the first thing that comes to mind. Oh, uh, I guess chicken curry. All right, chicken curry. <laughs> I don't know because. I don't know. That's just the first thing my mom used to do. It was like one of our like staple, like, you know, my mom, we always had like family, family dinner and, and, um, and she used to make these two dishes. She used to make a lot with like chicken breast, like tarragon chicken and chicken curry and both, you know, served over rice. But, um, and then that was like the dish that she taught me how to make. So when I first like, try to cook for a girlfriend in like ninth grade or whatever I made a chicken curry so that's just what popped in my head oh that's awesome I love that it's always our mom's cooking those are like always the memories that come up that's good yeah well, thanks, G, man. This has been awesome. It's like great. Uh, it's great in getting a chance to hear some of these like stories more in depth and uh, you, this has just been awesome, bro. Well, hey, man. Thank you, guys. And um, it's great to see you down at Sea Here Now and um See the kids getting big. Oh my gosh. Yeah, dude. All and, of our uh, kids. Like seeing Lewis and our kids, uh, you know, on those on the scaffolding backstage was so cool. Like, oh my gosh. And all just falling asleep in a giant pile of toddlers. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But um yeah, man, look forward to the next hang and the next surf and uh getting doing our thing, you know. Is there anything coming up that you want to announce? Obviously get out there and freaking freaking vote, right? Like everyone get out and vote. But uh is there any like shows or anything you're promoting currently that you want people to know about? Um well I'll have a new G Lab record come in spring yes. of two thousand nineteen, which I'm excited about. In the meantime, I've got the G Love coming home for Christmas record, Ooh. which is coming out on vinyl. Sick. Um, and that's coming out for sale this, um, you know, Black Friday. And then, um, and then we're going to have the 25th anniversary of the first record tour kicks off in January. Uh, that announces is coming soon. That'll be a coast to coast tour. And also along with that tour, we're releasing our second live, like official live recording. Um, which was recorded a couple years back at the Boulder Theater on a two-night stand. And it, the set, the first time we ever did, um, the first tour we ever did, like a, a pre-planned set, which was the first record, a performance of the first record in running order uh, live. And that's what the live record will be, that um, the 25th anniversary of the, so the live performance of the first record. So, awesome. Yeah, okay. that's all coming out, and that's kind of the stuff that's going on. Man, everything's a hustle but love, huh? <laughs> <laughs> that's right. All right, and then the last thing I'll say is, too, is we started, um, we started the Cape Cod Roots and Blues Fest this past summer up here in Cape Cod. Yeah. Which was awesome. We sold out 2,500 tickets, and it was Cope, Ripe, Ron Ortiz and, and G Love and Special Sauce. And this year, um, we're looking to double the capacity. And um, so stay tuned for that announcement. And yeah, that's, Sick. that's probably enough. Awesome. <laughs> Good stuff, man. Well, thanks, bro. Thank you, Gary. Appreciate we'll you, Gary. Thanks, guys. All right. We'll see you soon. Have Later, brother. One. 
Thank you so much for listening, guys. We appreciate you. If you like what we're doing, could we ask you to go to iTunes and leave us a nice review and rating? It really helps us and helps other people to know that we're providing a good podcast for you. If you'd like to find us on social media, you can find us at Shifting Perceptions Podcast. You can find my artwork at jalders.com or me on social media at jalders. You can find my beautiful wife, Chelsea, on ommamasdoulas.com or on social media at ommamasdoulas. And if you'd like to join our newsletter or find episodes online with show notes, you can go to shiftingperceptionspodcast.com. Until next week, talk to you then. See you guys. Thanks so much.